Hey there, welcome to Day Tripper Television. I'm Brian Weiss. And I'm Ross Chevalier. Today we're gonna go over a lot of interesting things about light and how you use your light. Uh, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into a brief introduction on what flash is and how to use flash. We're gonna go into the different types of flash that are available. We're also gonna get into how to balance your flash using the ETTL feature in your camera. Flash is the most powerful tool that we have that enables us to create and to control light. But to understand how best to use it, it's probably best to know where it came from, right? Well, flash, a lot of people remember flash. First of all, to understand where you would use flash, obviously there's all kinds of different types of light out there. There's sun, there's LED, there's all these different things, but sometimes you just need to generate your own light. So this is where flash comes in. Uh, flash originally had those big things where you'd hang them up with the magnesium powder in there and you'd, dilute, you'd light the powder and it would cause a lot of light and that's how you originally got your flash. Eventually it progressed to a bulb that had the magnesium and then it went to those little flash cubes that we'd get and the flash would explode and everybody would freak out because this flash exploded in their face. Well, it's really progressed quite a bit to the point where now we have flash in a handy little device like this. We have built-in little pop-up flashes on the top of our cameras and all kinds of extra studio strobe lights and flashes that are available for us to use. Flash is an incredibly powerful tool that allows us to also direct light. And as we go through the episode today, we're going to show you different ways that we can modify light. You'll hear this terminology a lot, light modifiers. Now there is a very key element to using flash with our digital single lens reflex and that's having the right shutter speed. Yeah, the problem with having the right shutter speed, it also implies that if your shutter's too fast or too slow, you might not get the same result you're looking for. Now, this is called the shutter sync speed. Some flashes and some cameras will allow you to sync up to 250th of a second. Others could be syncing up to 125th of a second. And maybe, Rashi you can explain that a little bit more in depth. Sure, you might recall when we were talking about shutter speed, we talked about first and second curtain. What we want to ensure is that our camera has the first curtain fully open and the second curtain hasn't started to move during the time of the flash exposure. Now, we also think of it, about this in terms of flash duration, but the reality is the flash is firing much faster than the shutter ever will. What I heard, somewhere around 30,000th of a second or so. At its fastest rate, but down as low as 750th of a second, in an older head firing full power. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, there's all kinds of different reasons why you'd want more speed and less speed. Um, now, how is this going to influence your, your photograph, though? Like, if you have a, a super fast flash versus a slower flash, how does that actually impact your photo? Well, that's a really interesting question because, in fact, it doesn't. If we're exposing properly for our flash, and you mentioned ETTL, or through the lens flash metering. TTL through the lens. We have the capability now to ensure that the exposure remains correct. The flash is, duration is very short, but in relation to the rest of the available light, the flash is, there's just so much more there. Even if we go to a slower shutter speed, we may not pick up a lot of available light, but that does lead us to an incredibly powerful tool called fill flash. So what's fill flash? Well, fill flash is a flash that you want to fill some light in somewhere. A lot of times if you're making a photograph and you find somebody's wearing a hat, you have a shadow when light is draping right. down from above. Fill flash is a handy tool to get a little bit of touch of light just underneath the cap of your hat. Now sometimes people will use their little pop-up flash for fill light. As you can see on my camera here, it's got a small little flash that pops right up on the top. And that's usually nice enough that it'll actually catch the light in your eyes a little bit. And again, as we say when you're doing portraiture, it's all about the eyes. So you want to really get that little bit of fill light going into the eyes. Now, some flashes of the larger variety have a fill light built into them. Absolutely. You have your main head where you get your, the majority of your, your light from, but then sometimes they have a little light on the front of the flash as well, which fires off a little bit more light, the fill light, catches you in the eyes and gives you that nice lack of shadow in that area. In fact, it's kind of interesting that most digital single lens reflex cameras today have a built-in flash, a pop-up, as Brian's demonstrated, mm -hmm. and yet most users never use it at all. And you should, because when you turn it on, your camera's going to set a, an appropriate flash sync speed completely automatically. You don't have to make a setting, and if you're taking pictures of family, friends, even under a tree outdoors, it's a bright day, 
you got some shadows breaking across the face, just pop that little flash up and the camera's going to synchronize and you're going to get a better exposure. And even with a slower shutter speed, you're not going to see the blur that you would normally see because the light is so bright and it hits you so directly. It leaves a really strong impression on the camera sensor of the actual image you're trying to see without any kind of blur or motion to it. And this is really, really key. It gives you so much more control over your images so you can make better photographs. And that's the whole point of what we're here to talk about. Leverage the flash to get better photos. Absolutely. Now, we start talking about flash, and especially a little pop-up flash, where you have a very, very small little spot that's actually right. sending out this extremely powerful amount of light. So sometimes what we find is we get red eye or we get a lot of glare coming off of a subject, or even just harsh shadows, things that don't really look very pleasing to the eye. So this is where we can get into things called flash modifiers. Now, we happen to have a product here called the Gary Fong Puffer. The Puffer is an interesting device that uh, the gentleman Gary Fong invented, and that, I actually have one here in my hand. It's actually a little two-piece set. You have your diffuser panel, and then you have your little piece that goes into the hot shoe of the flash directly behind the pop-up flash. So if we just slide this into place here, You'll see how easy this is. You just kind of slide it into place. And on the back of the Gary Fong, there's all these little holes that you can choose. And that just lets you adjust the height of where this diffuser is going to sit. When the flash is firing, you want that to fit or to fire right through the center of the diffuser. So you can line it up according to how high your flash is so that it makes a positive match. And when we do this, you'll notice that it's perfectly covering the front of the pop-up flash. So if it does fire, it's hitting the diffuser nicely, spreading that light out through a broad range and giving you a more even surface to work with. And this important idea of spreading light out is really, really key. When Brian had the diffuser off that little pop-up flash, you saw how tiny that flash tube was. The source is what we call a point source. And remember for our conversation about light, light spreads out in rays, so that's how we get the shadows. Because the flash is so close to the axis of the lens, that's how we get red eye. The light's coming right in, and remember that angle of reflectance, it's coming right back out, reflecting off the back of, the, uh, of your eyeball. And what do we see? Well, we see the blood vessels that are back there. And that's your red eye. And that's your red eye. And everybody has a different amount. Fair skin, young children. Light colored iris. It all has an influence on how much red eye you're actually going to get. Now, another way to get rid of, rid of red eye, and this is something that everybody has seen but never really noticed, if you ever look at how a paparazzi photographer shoots, they want that flash a little bit higher up off the camera. Right. That changes your angle of reflection, therefore not getting as much red eye. You don't see red eye in the cover of Star or any of these magazines with uh, the paparazzi photographers and so on. So a device they tend to use is called the strobo frame. Now, Ross has one on his camera, and you will be seeing that quite a bit more. But the concept of a strobo frame is the bottom screws onto the bottom of your camera. The top is just a little rack where then you can add your external flash. That raises your flash up off the camera quite a bit and also allows you to rotate the angle of that flash. So you can really move it around and get a perfect control of where your flash is going to go. And Ross will actually demonstrate that for us. So here, on this particular uh, instance, what I've got is a hot shoe flash. This happens to be a Mets flash and as Brian mentioned, could you tilt the head up for I'd me? I'd be happy to. You go. You'll see that there's a small little flash right on the front, that key flash. Now, when I mount this onto this frame, whoops, kind of hard to do all that one-handed. Yeah. Thanks. There we go. When we mount it onto the frame, it holds the flash firmly above the camera and holds it off-center. I'm also using a modifier, also from Gary Fong, called a light dome. And the dome just spreads the light out. And we'll see that as we talk more about modifiers. But by moving the light away from the lens, we reduce the risk of red eye. Frames can be incredibly powerful. They're very inexpensive accessories. But if you've got an external hot shoe mount flash, you can make even better images just by adding a frame. Now, I also notice you've got these little things attached to the bottom of your flash. I sure do. And the tools that I'm using are called wireless triggers. And when we look at the part of our episode where we talk about setting up our own home studio, we'll see how wireless triggers can eliminate a lot of the hazards that come with having cables everywhere. 
a wireless trigger allows us to fire our flash from wherever we are and even shoot around corners. So I might have lights placed behind a stairwell. You know, we were talking about real estate photography the other day. We've got a good friend, Darren. That's what he does for a living. He can place flashes anywhere mm -hmm. and trigger them wirelessly and light up a whole room without it being really obvious that there's a, a flash set up there. Now, on that point, there's a lot of situations, and you're seeing an image that I have coming up soon, where you don't need any of these wireless triggers. Some cameras actually have the ability to fire flash right off the camera themselves. For example, my camera has this thing called the Creative Lighting System. Canon recently started putting that in some of their cameras, like the T3i, the 60D, or the 7D. The concept is your pop-up flash is the transmitter, rather than the wireless transmitters. It sends a signal to your slave flashes, which then can be controlled as far as how bright and dark they are, right from the camera. So you can actually set this up in an environment like a concert, or in the example, examples that you're going to see from me, um, at the Toronto Zombie Walk, when Henry's actually sponsored the Zombie Walk, and we took portraits of the zombies as they stepped into the frame, wireless flashes set up in the environment, the camera triggers the flash, no cords involved for people to jump and trip over. It makes things a lot more straightforward. Yeah, let's have a look at that image, and you can see how multiple flash heads were used to create a very powerful image but you didn't have to run wires or run around and set up a bunch of different flash guns. Not only did we not have to run wires or anything like that, but we didn't have to edit the photo afterward. With our available light that we use, and with the flashes that we use, and the ability to control the brightness of each flash individually, we can make the photograph look exactly as we want to look at, or want it to look, even before we show it, or before we actually uh, print it. Now, Brian, you also run into situations where there's just not enough available light to get an image, and you've got an image that we're putting up right. to address that kind of situation. Obviously when you're running photography day trips you get into all different environments. The image that we have here was taken on our uh, trip to the Niagara Falls. This was actually at the Bird Kingdom in Niagara Falls and this actually was, actually, it was in a cage that was pitch black. We knew there was a bat in the cage. We didn't know where it was because it was obviously quite camouflaged inside the dark environment. When your flash fires the camera was able to focus. It sent out a little pre-flash, gave the camera something to see. It focused on the bat the flash fired and illuminated the entire subject. Now you notice behind the, the bat, there's a harsh shadow. And that shadow was obviously created by the flash hitting that, that bat and causing right. a shadow. Now you can also use flash for creative effect as we see in the image that's coming up now. And this is one of my favorite things to shoot. I am more of a, um, a slow shutter speed, visual effect kind of fun type of photographer. I love having that interesting look. Now this is not a photoshopped image. This is me in the backyard playing around with some flash and having a good time getting multiple images in a single frame. This is done by having a slower shutter speed where the shutter would remain open, in this case for 15 seconds. When the camera took the initial photo, it fired the first flash that lit me in the front. I then stood up, walked behind myself and manually fired a second flash at myself, creating the second impression. So having the two images in the one shot was a lot of fun. The only thing I didn't control, if we can actually bring the image up one more time, because this is the fun part of the image. As it was in the backyard, you'll notice that my solar lights were lit up, glowing my nipples, which wasn't exactly something I planned for, but it was a funny side effect. Family show, dude. Family show. <laughs> now, there's a lot of other environments that you can take a great photograph, and sometimes things are a little harder to shoot than others. Exactly. What we're going to see is how we can use modifiers to make these images more effective. So we're going to take a short break. When we come back, be ready for flash modifiers. Hey, welcome back to Day Tripper Television. Today we're talking about flash, how to make better photos by augmenting the available light. Now, Brian, before the break, you were talking about how you were using flash in some more challenging scenarios. Absolutely. Um, my cat, 
I personally think she's the best in history, but that's just me. Um, she's a, a really difficult cat to shoot. She's called a tortoiseshell, very dark fur, really difficult to get focus lock, especially in low light situations. So one day I just happened to have a soft box, a, a photo box set up, which is essentially a box with, with soft light that you can shine through it. And she was just a curious cat, you know what they say about cats. She stepped into the box, she took one turn and looked at me, I took one photograph, and because the light was all there, I got the perfect image, and this is actually an image that is one of my favorite shots of her. Um, it really shows the eyes because the light is being added to it. It really shows her color. It really shows a lot of the detail of her whiskers and so on. And this is something that you just can't achieve, especially in normal lighting, unless you supply your own light. And this is the idea behind flash, the ability to supply our own light. Now, there's a couple of scenarios where the type of flash that we've talked about so far just won't do the job. Sometimes we need to capture something and we're fairly close to it, and we want to see very flat light because we're trying to freeze action. And you've got a shot that tells this story. Absolutely. The next shot that you're going to see, I went to a, a customer's house and she, would let, she wanted me to take photos of her cat, and I just followed her cat around with a, a flash, very much like this ring flash right here, on my camera. Now, the ring flash is something that you put around the front of your lens, and it shines light directly out from, essentially, your lens. This is the part that goes into your hot shoe. It sends the signal through the cord, which actually fires the elements in your flash. Now, the photograph that you actually see is a CJ stopped, f completely frozen, and that's because I supplied all the light by the ring flash. Now, one thing that it was a side effect, unfortunately, we talked about this in a previous episode, is focus. Your camera, if it's in automatic focus, will automatically choose the most static, vivid object in the shot. And as you can see in this image here, CJ's not perfectly in focus, but the couch behind is. So these are also things that you want to be aware of, not only just where your light's going, but what's actually in focus. Exactly. Now, sometimes we need more than what we can get from our particular flash units. So we've talked about the built-in flash, We've talked about the hot shoe flash, but sometimes we're outdoors or in a very large set situation and we need more power. We need the kind of power that's only going to come from a studio flash head. Now, if we take a look at the image that's coming up, what you're going to see is two distinctly lit elements. The little girl and... Yeah, that's me. That's Brian. <laughs> God, that's frightening. Gotta love Halloween. You're getting a hint about Brian, right? Halloween, <laughs> zombies, rotting. Yeah, it's all fun. It's all good here. <laughs> By using more powerful flash units that can be more directional, we have the capability to control the light even more and not have to depend on walls, ceilings, other surfaces to provide reflectance. That's right. In fact, here we've got an example of this type of flash. So when we come back, what we're going to see is a studio head. Now, Brian, right behind you, Right here. We've got a studio flash head. Now, this happens to be a 500 watt second flash head. On average, that's about five times more powerful than what we're going to get from one of our hot shoe flashes. The idea here lots of power through a very powerful tube, and then possibly direct it through something that's even softer, a softer light source. So as we look at how we can use modifiers, this is just one of those modifier types. Now, naturally, the larger the, the source, the more the light's going to be dispersed. Right. The softer the light. Just as we put the puffer on top of that particular camera, when we put the scrim here on the front of the softbox, it allows us the capability to get very soft light. And here's a tip. Whenever we use light softening tools, get that light as close to your subject as possible. So if we were doing a studio shot right now, and I promise you, I would not be the model. <laughs> I put the model as close as I possibly could to my source of light, just as long as I kept it out of frame. Now, this particular softbox that we're looking at is called a strip light because it's designed to light the human body when they're in a vertical orientation. But when we look at these types of tools, whether it's the built-in flash with a pop-up, whether it's a shoe mount flash that we see mounted on my camera, 
that Brian's shown you that's got a little gel tape to it, whether we're using a ring flash or a studio flash, the idea is to make the light the way you want it. And you mentioned the gels that I have on this. Yeah. When you saw the photograph of the, the zombie walk, you noticed the background was red. Well, that's not a red light we fired. That's a normal flash with a little red gel that goes over the front of it. By changing the color of your gel, you can change the color of your background. So for that example, we thought zombies, blood red, let's make the background red. The background was actually quite gray, but because we shine the light with the red gel on it, it totally changed the color of the gel. So using a backdrop like a big white backdrop or something like that can turn into many different colors. There's red, there's green, there's blue, there's yellow. There's so many different numbers of gels that you can add. You can make any mood you're looking for. One of the really great things about using flash is that you have so much control. So if you think about it this way, what the purpose of the flash is, is to get proper light on my subject. But Brian already illustrated with his photograph of the zombie, and as we saw the Halloween picture, we can use more than one flash to get the lighting that we're looking for. We can use main lights, side lights, hair lights, key lights, and back lights. By using multiple sources of light, and flash is a very inexpensive, very powerful, and very controllable tool, we can make amazing images that otherwise we just could not have done. Now one of the things that folks ask about is how do I know which modifier to use? So later in the episode we're going to see a video where we use a number of different modifiers to help us get to those effects. We'll take a look at those, but as you can see we've got some of them out here in front of us. Well we've already talked about things like the Gary Fong. Gary Fong has a lot of different products, one of them being the light sphere, as Ross has the one that is called the collapsible light sphere. It folds down a little bit smaller. If you look at this one that we have on the counter here, you notice that it's quite tall. It's a little bit difficult to keep in your camera bag. Sometimes the collapsible is a better option for you, but there again is choice. We also have the Gary Fong flash multiplier. This guy here is a chrome finish. When the flash travels through it, it actually amplifies the output of your light. So it's making your flash a lot brighter than what it might normally be. Now flashes also come in different brightnesses. Absolutely. For example, this Nissan flash right here is not their most powerful version, where the flash that we actually have, the Nissan that we have in the softbox behind us, is the more powerful version. Now, the way you would choose one or the other would be the size of the room you're shooting in, if you're indoors, if you're outdoors. All of these things are relevant to how bright your flash needs to be. Now, we talked earlier about the idea of through the lens flash metering, TTL flash. By metering through the lens, we can ensure that the exposure is correct for our flash without having to use flash meters or automatic metering systems or even trying to guess through manual. There's another value proposition that through the lens brings to us, and Brian talked about it when we were discussing the commander mode on the Nikon cameras or the remote control mode in the Canon line, and that's the ability to trigger multiple flashes from a single location. One little flash fires multiple flashes, and you mentioned flashes coming in different sizes, but some flashes also have variable power. Absolutely. Um, the flashes that we always tend to use have different degrees that you can make your brightness. You can go up a quarter stop, a full stop, make your flashes much brighter that way. But if you get into a studio situation, all of a sudden now you have a nice little slider you can work with. You can just literally turn the slider up by a tenth of a stop if you want to, and it will gradually make your flash brighter and brighter and brighter. The idea here is to be able to establish more control of light. One of the key elements to successful flash is getting a good exposure, and TTL is a great way to do that with what we call small flash. Small flash is an off-camera flash, such as the ones that we've talked about. However, when we get to studio flash, uh, the game changes considerably. Quite a bit. And then we need to think about what else can we be using to make the photograph effective. So let's look at some of our options. We've got our flashes, we're getting the right types of images that we like, but let's suppose, for example, that we don't have lots of flash heads, we don't have the money to do that. What we want to do instead is we want to add to the light without having to change things. Well, one of the effective ways to do that is through a modifier. And a modifier could be something like this. 
a reflector. All the reflector does is reflect light. By placing the reflector in the appropriate space, we can take light that's coming into us, remember, angle of incidence, angle of reflectance, and we could throw more light onto our subject. Did that cost us anything? Well, it just cost us the reflector. We can also find reflectors that have different finishes. So this reflector is finished silver. That's going to give us very white light. But let's suppose I want a more golden light. I want to fake out the look of late afternoon sun. I can use what's called a sun fire. And what the sun fire will do is give us that golden reflected light. So now, if I were to fire it back at Brian, I'm warming up the right-hand side of his face. And by warming up the image, changing the color temperature of the light through the use of a reflector, I'm able to change how things look. Now, as I move the reflector, and thank you so much for this, <laughs> you can see the light falls differently on Brian's face. We can control the shadow and how the light falls with something this simple. Now, one of the really nice things about reflectors is that they're very portable. I can literally fold this into a little circle and carry it with me in my gadget bag anywhere I want to go. There are, of course, larger reflectors. This reflector, for example, gives us the silver. It gives us white. It gives us the warm tones simply by zipping on and off the covers. It does two other things, too, which are very, very cool for you as a photographer. It can add a diffusion screen, kind of like a really big dome, that you fire your light through to create the sense of very soft light. And that white dis diffusion screen, often known as morning light, is ideal for portraits of women, portraits of young children, anything where you really want to enhance the softness of the skin. Very complimentary. It's very complimentary light. Now, one last thing in this reflector example, it also has black. Now, Brian, why the heck would we want black in a reflector? Well, one of the things we talked about previously is how white will reflect light and black absorbs light. So if you're trying to isolate your subject, you fit it in front of a black background, and that's actually going to give you a more direct light on the subject and less distraction behind, amongst other things. Right. The other way that we can use a black reflector is to actually draw light away. We said that black does not reflect light, it absorbs light. So if, for example, I want to enhance a shadow breaking across a face, I could put a black reflector out of frame, and that will minimize re reflected light back into our faces. So in that example, reflectors, while they are most often silver or sometimes gold, used with caution, or white, also a black reflector can be very powerful to create a sense of dynamic tension, and we see this used to great effect in photographs of men, particularly when we're wanting to create an image of, you know, a grizzled face, you know, show the beard. When we come back, we're going to take a look at some more sophisticated modifying tools. See you in a sec. Welcome back to Day Tripper TV. We're going to move on right now to a, an interview and a, a presentation that Ross has actually done with our good friend Louise Booth, who helped us out with some of our video production off the side. Um, basically, we're going to go into some video or some, some how to use light in a practical sense, more in a studio environment. We promised you a section on modifiers. The, here's where you're going to see modifiers used in a real practical sense. So let's have a look. Enjoy. Hey everyone, Ross is here. I'm here with my good friend Louise Booth of Booth Productions. Louise is a professional videographer and she's uh, being very gracious in giving us her time and her face to help us with our Better Flash segment. So in this sequence, we're going to look at ways to get better flash pictures with your DSLR camera. We're going to work with in-camera flash, on-camera flash, and off-camera flash. And Louise is 
very graciously agreed to be our lovely model. Thank you so much. In the first shot, we're going to set up Louise on the simple background. You can use whatever you'd like in your home. And we're going to take a regular DSLR camera and use the pop-up flash. And what we're going to see from that, although we can take a nice picture, what I expect you'll see are some fairly harsh shadows. So we're going to take a break. I'm going to grab a camera. We'll come back, and we'll shoot that. OK, so I'm going to step out of the frame. And we're going to take a photograph of Louise. Now, for the purpose of this photograph, I'm just going to use the little built-in flash that's built in to this Canon 7D. Many cameras that we all encounter are going to have something similar. And I'm going to shoot my favorite portrait lens, the 70 to 200 28. What this allows for is a really beautiful crop on the person and nice depth of field compression. Are you ready, ma'am? Sure. OK. That's good. OK, two more. So now when we show you the actual shot, and as you saw, we had some fairly harsh shadows come up behind Louise. Now, there's a couple of very inexpensive ways that we can improve the quality of that shot and do Louise some justice. One of the simplest ways is to diffuse the flash. So I've got the pop-up flash on the camera, and by putting on a little device in front of it called a puffer, we're going to be able to get a softer look. So let's take a couple of shots that way. Come this way, Louise. One more. It's okay, you can smile. One. That's what we're going to see is a much softer look. Now, this does consume a bit more flash power, so you might have to get a little bit closer. But it's a really nice way to soften the pictures without having to carry a whole lot of extra kit. Now, next, we're going to take a look at using the flash on camera. So here we've got our generic on-camera flash. And I think you know what's going to happen when we point this right at Louise. What's going to happen? Very harsh. Very harsh. I don't think we should be harsh. Well, let's show you what it looks like regardless. Oh, yeah, we got our harsh right there. OK, so in these very harsh conditions where we threw a lot of shadow behind us, this is kind of like what we're going to encounter in our homes and in family gatherings. We don't have all kinds of space to make distance between our subject and our background. And we're using a very plain background just to call out how this shadow can affect you. So the first thing we're going to do is use a diffuser on top of the flash. This is a diffuser from a company called Stofen. And it just sort of. It just sort of slides right onto the flash head with enormous, amazing simplicity, or not. And now we'll take from the same position, the same shots again. And what we'll see is that the images of Louise look nice, a little softer, but we're still throwing shadow behind her. So what we're going to do next is move to another piece of equipment where we can see how we can soften that light even more. OK. For the next set of photos, we're going to use a device from a guy called Gary Fong. This is called the Light Dome. And we orient it so it's facing up. Now, one of the neat things about the Fong is if you have a flash where the head rotates, you can orient the head so it's always pointing up. Now, this is a whole lot more effective than bouncing off a ceiling because we're going to lose a lot of light going up and down. And we don't know how good the ceiling is as a reflective surface. So, you okay for a couple more? Sure. All right. Good. So what you see when we look at these photographs is 
No shadow. No harshness. And the light is wrapping really nicely around Louise's face. And this is where these types of tools can really start to make a difference. And they're not horribly expensive. But we'll give you a sense, we're nothing that we're at used so far is over $100. So pretty easy to make better flash pictures just using some of the tools that we've used so far. Next, we're going to take a look at a bounce card. Okay, so this is what a bounce card looks like. They are flexible with a very reflective material on the front. And this is really the classic way to get better flash photographs before things like the light dome came out. So I'll take some more photographs with this. And what we're going to find is we're going to get a little bit more contrast out of this and a little bit more shadow. OK? And it would appear I was right. There's a lot more shadow when we use the bounce card. But this can be another inexpensive way to get a much softer light, because basically what we do is we convert this tiny little focus area into something much larger. Not as soft as the light dome, but it does retain more flash power. So if I've got to reach a longer distance, that might be something to consider. Next, we're going to move to off-camera flash. So now we've moved the flash off-camera. And what we're using is an off-camera flash cord that preserves the through the lens flash metering to our camera. And I'm using my favorite bracket. This is the Really Right Stuff bracket because it makes it really simple if I'm shooting horizontally. And then when I want to go vertical, just flip it. And now I've got still proper flash orientation. Now, I've still got the phone on, so I'm going to flip it up. So we get that nice soft light. But what's going to happen when we keep the flash above the camera? We then throw any shadows that are being cast down behind our subject. So we don't see anything harsh at the same level, but perhaps something a little bit behind. Let's try. The goal of getting the flash off the camera is that we are removing that source of light as far as we can reasonably from the axis of the lens. As we've talked about in other episodes, what comes through the lens is going to create that image. So we want to make sure that we're getting a nice simulation of sunlight. As we've discussed, that's what flash is doing, but without it firing directly into the lens and creating a lot of harsh shadows. So the more that we can move the flash off camera, the better. Now we could do this again using the Stofan. We could do it using the bounce card. But next, we're going to move to something that you can still do in your home. Remember, up until now, we've only looked at accessories really below $100. A decent frame like this, like a Strobe frame, around $120, $130 will help you get your flash off camera. And then whatever your camera vendor's cord is all you'll need to preserve the TTL. Next, we're going to take a look at using a softbox. And this is going to be a softbox not that uses expensive studio lighting, but that can use exactly the same flash that you purchased for your camera. So now we're back and we're going to use a softbox. Now the softbox is off screen in the video because frankly if we put it in you couldn't see Louise and that would really be bad. What I'm using is a wireless trigger system. So it plugs into the hot shoe on the camera and then there's a wireless receiver out there inside the softbox on the flash. Now what you're going to see with the softbox is an incredibly soft amount of light that because it's such a giant source, it's going to wrap really nicely uh, around Louise's face, but it's, but it's also going to give us some really wonderful softening and shadows that we didn't see with any of the other solutions. So I'm just going to step aside and take a couple of shots. Let me, Louise, it's okay. I don't bite. And that's about it. So we started just using the pop-up flash that's built into the camera, added a puffer to diffuse it. Then we went to a flash mounted on our camera and used a variety of different diffusing types. Then we went to the flash on the bracket, using the Fong diffuser, really soft light. And we ended up with off-camera flash, the flash mounted in a softbox, and giving us beautiful soft light, a really nice set of shadows, 
We're set off at about 30 degrees from Louise, so we get a nice break across her face. And as you see in the images that we're putting up, you can see the transition from harsh direct light, what most folks are accustomed to with flash, moving to beautiful soft light. Now, to get here, we haven't spent a fortune. In fact, the current setup is the most expense that we've added onto our system of camera and flash. The softbox, this kit, it's called the Apollo Orb, super popular amongst professional photographers, and probably around $180. I'm using a wireless kit. This happens to be the Honol wireless kit, and it's less than $100. Certainly, there's more expensive kit that you can buy, but you don't have to. You can get wonderful pictures of wonderful people very, very simply. Thanks for watching the segment. Welcome back. Great video, Ross. Well done. Well, thanks, Brian. The idea in the video, and it is a bit long, I understand, but the idea is to go through all the different modifiers that most folks are commonly going to encounter in making photographs in their home, with their family, and with their friends. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the, some of the tools that you might use to build a small home studio setup. See you in a sec. Welcome back to Day Tripper TV. We've gone over the video, we've seen a lot of really interesting things about how to modify light and so on, but now what we want to do is we want to talk about how do we actually create our own home studio with whatever accessories that you might need. For that, Ross is going to go into a little bit more in-depth detail. Thanks, Brian. We've talked a bit about how we're going to leverage our flash tools. It could be something as simple as a hot shoe mount flash with a diffusion dome. Now, as you saw in the video, the diffusion dome produced very, very soft light with almost no backing shadow. So if you can only do one thing, offshoot flash, get yourself one of these diffusion domes, be it the firm one or be it the flexible one, either one's going to do the job for you. And you may have recalled the orientation is not pointing at your subject, the orientation is pointing straight up. This creates a very soft, very round light source that creates beautiful white light. Now, what if we can do a little bit more than that, but we still don't want to get into a studio flash head? The next step is to take our hot shoe flash, do something a little different with it. What we can do is we can put it into a soft box. This is a Lastolite soft box, lots of different vendors out there, and we can see that we've got our shoe mount flash mounted in a track and the head is firing through a hole in the back of the box. Now, a soft box is really a silver lined or white lined non-reflective outer, outer skin that allows us to trigger the flash, have it bounce the light around inside, and then push it out through this very soft scrim. In the past, soft boxes were extremely expensive. But you can now get into softbox kits, if you will, which is a stand, bracket, softbox itself for under $200. In fact, part of our photo contest, we are in including a full softbox kit in that, in that contest. Oh, that's pretty cool. So if you're entering the photo contest, you'll have an opportunity to win one of those prizes. Absolutely. Now, the nice thing about this particular kit is I didn't have to go out and buy another flash head. Everything self-contained comes in two bags, a bag for the stand and bracket and a bag for the softbox itself, which in fact folds flat. So that's one good step in building your home studio. So, you know, if you've got a single flash, a couple hundred bucks, and you've really got beautiful soft light. Now, when we take flash photographs, and Brian mentioned this earlier, we're often going to want the capability to control what's in the background to prevent it from being distracting. Also from Last Delight, we've brought what we can see here on the far, or my far right, this is a Last Delight pop-up backdrop. 
Now pop-up backdrops come in a lot of different colors. They come in white, gray, black, and all the colors of the rainbow. But Brian, you said it. Why don't I need to buy all color, different colored backgrounds? With the use of gel, with the use of distance, with the use of where your flash is in place with your backdrop and your, your subject, your white backdrop can be turning into many different colors. You can make it gray, you can make it black, and of course with the use of the gels and the different light modifiers, you can make them any color you like. The idea of buying a backdrop is a great idea. Now they can come as a pop-up, they can also come in paper rolls or muslin cloth that you simply hang literally across a broom handle. And that provides a great background. The background allows you to create separation and then you don't have to worry about whatever is behind it. Anywhere can be a studio. Another interesting thing is the more distance we create with flash between our subject and the background, we can also control the color. So while this background in our studio, because it's extraordinarily well lit, looks white, with a flash photograph, if Brian were taking a photograph of me and he exposed from my face, that would drop out to a very, very dark gray. And that's ideal. So you don't have to spend a lot of money on kit to get a decent backdrop set. Maybe a roll of white paper, roll of black paper. Might be all you need. But what if you wanted softer light, bigger light? Well, I could buy bigger lights, but I could still use my hot shoe flash. Instead, I would shoot through an umbrella. Now, originally umbrellas were designed for the purpose of reflecting. They were silver lined on the inside edge. We would fire into that silver reflector and it would make a big bowl and fire it out. Recently, vendors have released what are called parabolic umbrellas. And if you remember from your high school science, a parabolic mirror actually focuses the light. Parabolic umbrellas also focus the light. This particular umbrella from FJ Westcott is a seven foot umbrella designed for shoot through, meaning I don't reflect light from the inside of the umbrella, I actually fire light through the umbrella. And if you take a look at it, you can imagine what's going to happen. My small light source is going to become a giant light source as I pass the light through that umbrella. Now the wattage of the flash is very important for this too though. Oh, absolutely. If we're going to be using the entry level flashes, the, the very low wattage versions of these flashes, you take that amount of light and you try and spread it out over that gigantic of a space, your light's going to get much softer as a result. So starting with a more powerful flash head for this particular purpose would be an advisable thing. Actually, Brian, I think that you've hit the nail on the head. Folks ask all the time, well, what flash should I buy? Really, you should buy the most powerful flash you can afford. Because as Brian pointed out earlier, we can always dial the power down. Dialing power up, not so easy no. when you're already maxed out. That's right. So the more the power... The volume goes to 11. The volume goes to 11, exactly. <laughs> a spinal tap moment for flash. <laughs> the idea though, buy the most powerful flash that you can possibly get. Now, what if I can't get in a shoe mount flash exactly the level of light that I want? Can I do something else? I can. That's when I can go to a studio flash. And I know we're talking about your home, but what's really cool is what used to be literally tens of thousands of dollars, we now have see kits in under a thousand dollars with a pair of heads, pair of stands, pair of umbrellas. You're pretty much good to go. They run off AC power, so they run off the mains. You don't need to spend a ton of money on battery packs and all that stuff and they take a number of modifiers. This happens to be a Bowens model uh, studio light. This is the 500 Pro. It's 500 watt seconds and the Pro means it does two things. I can control it with a radio, no cable required, and I can also control the power output of the flash. I can turn it up and down using a remote control. Now let's see how that might work. It's actually scary easy. So I've got my camera right here on top of my camera, I'm using a device called a Pocket Wizard. Pocket Wizard is one of the best known names in radio controlled flash. We talked about the value of radio. Brian also talked about remote control from the vendors. That tends to be infrared. Doesn't work quite as well outdoors or doesn't, definitely doesn't work around corners. Or through walls. Or through walls. Radio tends to have a lot more control. So I've got my transmitter on top of my camera 
and that particular Bowen's head is fitted with a pocket wizard receiver. So I could simply point and the flash goes off whenever I press the shutter button. Obviously it's not aimed at Brian, so that's going to be a fairly crappy photo, <laughs> but you get the idea. Now remember that we talked about TTL. When we get to studio flash, there is no TTL. So how do we know that our flash exposure is correct? Well, a couple of ways. How many photos can we shoot with a digital camera, Brian? As many as you like. Right, meaning that we can use the view, the viewer, if you will, on the back of the camera and say, yeah, good, bad, indifferent, roll the exp exposure up and down. Does changing the shutter speed matter? Not really. No, now we're working with the aperture. By varying the aperture, we can see how much light is coming in or not. Here's another way to do it. Do it right, take an exposure. And if I turn on my flash meter, it'll work a lot better. And this tells me five, six and a half at two fiftieth of a second. So what can you do about this? Well, we got a contest. We sure do. And actually the assignment for this episode is actually make your photograph with flash. Now, this is going to be a little bit easy for some people, but it's going to be a little more tricky for others. So, the concept, make a photo with flash, submit it to photocontest at dtptv.com, we'll review your images, and hopefully we'll be talking about your images on one of our episodes in the future. Thanks for watching. See you again soon. Take the lens cap off.